Okay, uh, welcome back to the AGDA track of the uh, hottest summer school 2022. Uh, today we have Anders Morberg's second of uh, three lectures on cubicle AGDA. And today he'll be telling us about set quotients, cubicle transport, and con composition. Take it away. Thank you, Carlo. All right, so here we go, lecture eight. Um, right, so last time I showed you the basics of essentially cubical type theory in general, but cubic lag like in particular. So there was this cubical interval with an I, and then uh, yeah, with endpoints, I0 and I1. I'm sure you will become familiar with that by now. And then the equality is now uh, a path, path P. So a special case of this path P, which path P is a uh, path over. Um, right, so we're all on the same page. And then we had all these nice cubicle higher inductive types. So I did a bunch of the higher inductive types that Dan showed in Bukot style in Agda, and I did them cubicle style, where you can write them as data declarations. And the, the, because paths are just functions out of the interval, the higher constructors just become uh, like, constructors with multiple arguments where some of the arguments are interval variables. Um, okay, so today I'm gonna show some more high inductive types, but a kind of a special class, the ones that stays within the realm of sets. So last time the high inductive types were kind of topology and homotopy theory inspired. Today there will be more, um, I don't know, uh, general math and uh, computer science inspired, I would say, where we stay within the nice realm of sets where we don't have to worry about all of this higher structure. Um, okay, so that will be the first part. And then I'm gonna talk about this cubicle transport that I just showed essentially as a black box in the form of this transp operator. So I'm gonna explain that then and then show how you derive path induction from it. Um, and then if there is time, I will also cover each comp or homogeneous composition. And if you combine that with this transport operation, you get this thing uh, called con composition or like the, yeah, special composition operations of, of cubicle type theories. So yeah, that's the plan and we'll see how far we get, but um, the notes are up online as well. All right, so uh, set quotients. Okay, I think you've seen a few ex oops, examples before. Uh, in the course, but let's look at some more of them um, in cubicle like style. So let's do the general form. So, or maybe I could talk a bit about them first. Okay. So the idea is essentially we want some form of quotienting operation. So we take a type A, A uh, is a type, and some relation I keys. Type valued relation or some people take each prop valued relation. Um, I'm going to talk about the difference soon, but uh, for now we can see this being type valued. And then we want to form uh, want a quotient type A mod R, right? So there are countless examples of this, like in in mathematics and computer science, where you have some type and you want to quotient by a relation, right? Um, and this is something that was um, hard to do and kind of a mess in pre homotopy type theory type theories. So in some sense, I mean, this is one of the yeah, very exciting additions to type theory. Um, I would say like we can get quotients to work nicely um, within a system like Agda. There were other systems before where you had forms of quotients, but Agda didn't really support any kind of quotients and people were doing all kinds of hacks to get around these kind of problems. Um, but uh, now we can do them very nicely. Uh, so let me show you how. So we want an operator slash, which takes a type. Let's see <coughs> if I get away with not putting any levels here. In my notes, I have levels, but I'm gonna be brave and try without them here because they just clutter things a bit. Okay, good. Nice colors. Oops, now I increased the font, but maybe this font size is good. If it's too small, please tell me and I'll increase the size. Okay, so how do we define a quotient type as a high inductive type? So we need some way of 
I mean, if you want a quotient, uh, we want a map from A into the quotient, and then we need some kind of path that um, equates related elements. Um, so by related, I mean things that are um, in the relation R. Okay, so the map, the injection, I'm gonna write with um, brackets like this. And like I said, it's gonna be a map from A into A mod R. And then we're gonna have this um, path constructor, which for any A and B in A that are related, we um, get a path between bracket A and bracket B. Okay, so that's nice. Um, looks pretty cool. Um, no big surprises, I guess. Um, and we can now plug in whatever type you want and quotient by a nice relation. Um, only problem is the way I did it here, um, the result is not a set. And I said we want to do set quotients. So to achieve that, I'm going to add another constructor, trunk, which is essentially going to force this thing to be a set. And I think you've seen truncations in the both track, at least. Maybe Dan showed you some as well. Um, and you could just throw it in as a higher constructor as well. So for any A and B in A mod R, and any two paths uh, connecting A to B, we get a path from P to Q. OK. Um, and this is essentially like forcing the result to be a set. Um, and we can write this kind of slicker by instead ju just writing is set this guy. And this is this. Oops, why didn't it turn green? OK, now it's green. Good. Yeah, so <coughs> can compress the result type a bit, but if you unfold it, you get exactly the same thing. So, but it looks a bit nicer like this. So, uh, but I can comment uh, out the unfolding and put it here so you can keep it in mind. All right, but uh, that's it. So, okay, good. So um, that's nice. Let's um, first do a little example. And then I'm going to talk Andrews, about, yes. If A is a set and R is a prop valued relation, do you still need the truncation? Yes. If you want to set out, so that's a good question. So, uh, OK, let's do that. What happens uh, if A is a set and R is prop valued? Uh, do you need truck question mark? So that's the questions. Uh, and the answer is yes, if you want to set out. And the counter example is very simple. So if you take unit for A and, uh, and essentially R is the total relation that uh, relates all elements of units, so it relates TT or dot or whatever you call it, the only element of unit to itself, then A mod R. Uh, is equivalent to S1 because if we don't have the trunk constructor, if we don't have trunk constructor. So why? Because um, we get a single map um, or, well, we get a single element because uh, we get it. Unit mod total relation um, like that. So what happens? So we get this constructor, we get a map from unit to this type, but there is only one such map. Um, and then, and that corresponds to the base point. And then this thing, because it's a total relation, um, we only get one path relating the one element uh, to itself. So that's like the loop. So, right, so you have to be careful because like this is probably the most trivial quotient you can take and you still, raise the truncation level. So S1 is not a set, it's a one type a groupoid. Um, so you can think of a prop valued relation as defining a directed graph. And then you can imagine throwing away your direction from any arrow. And then you can ask, are there any um, cycles in this graph? And if there are, then that will happen. Exactly. Yeah. So um, 
And in the total relation on, on one element, you have like one cycle, right? So that's why you get this one loop. Um, so that's very helpful um, intuition. So it's kind of, I mean, yeah, might seem surprising that you need the trunk, but when you see this example, you realize, okay, well, if you don't truncate, really crazy things can happen if you plug in a complicated A and a complicated relation. So uh, you better truncate if you want to set. Or Very a simple good. A in relation, yeah. Yeah. In this case. <laughs> That's true, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's yeah. A, actually the converse question now. So someone asks, so if we do have a trunk, then uh, what if R isn't prop valued? Oh yeah, so what happens to that? Um, right, so what happens if uh, A is not a set, but R is not prop valued? That was the question. Um, okay, so uh, nothing too bad happens. I mean, you can still form quotients this way, um, but uh, well, uh, but uh, the but A mod R won't have all the properties you want. For example, uh, you won't be able to prove a effectivity of the quotient, which says that for any A and B in A, if they are relate, like equated by the injection, then they were actually related. So you won't get this kind of property. So essentially that, that this, that you can go back and forth there essentially. Um, so this you want to have, and for many examples, you need it um, to prove cool things. So, I mean, you get some kind of quotient, but it's not effective. And like I said, in many examples, you want effective quotients. Um, and it will be a set in particular because, because oh, yeah. trunk always asserts that it's a set. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it will be a set. Yeah, by definition, but it's sort of- By def, yeah. Yeah, yeah. not, but, not clear uh, but, what it is. But you yeah. want to have all the nice properties you want. I mean, it's some form of quotient, but it's not it's not, uh, not necessarily an effective asset quotient. That's one way to see it. Um, yeah, good. Thanks a lot. Although, for this. I mean, yeah. to be effective, you also need R to be an equivalence relation, right? Ah, yes. Uh, this yeah. I, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Also need uh, R equivalence relation. And proof uses univalence for uh, proof of effectivity uses univalence for purpose for H prop. So prop propositional extensionality that um, <coughs> multiply equivalent propositions are equal. Okay. And I think my cat is going crazy in the background. So I'm sorry if you hear crazy noises, but uh, it's just a cat, don't worry. Um, <laughs> okay, good, very good. So these are two things that I wanted to say, um, but uh, it's nice to get them as questions. Now I can show you an example. Huh. Um, let's put the example up here. So we have the nice um, relation here. Um, okay, so what was the example I want to show? I wanted to show you the integers yet another way. Okay, so let's define the integers the way it's done. Um, in some math books, also on uh, Wikipedia. Um, like if you go to Wikipedia, you have a to the integers and you click on construction, this is the construction you'll see. Um, and it's some kind of quotients of pairs of numbers. So you relate the pair AB with the pair CD if A plus D is equal to B plus C. So it's kind of a straightforward quotient. So let's do that. And the intuition is that like, um, the pair AB stands for A minus B. Um, so like one minus three should be the same as uh, two minus four and three minus five, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the idea. So let's type it up. Oops, ugly N. Okay, so we wanna take pairs. I'm gonna this this way where rel has some type and rel uh, has some definition okay 
So this is kind of convenient. I, I sometimes like to omit the type when I'm typing something up and then sometimes I can infer it for us. Yes, I press, uh, press control C, control S and get the type automatically from Agda. That's quite nice. Um, if you're lazy like me and don't like to type too much. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. So that's good. And what did I say? We want to relate a comma b uh, with c comma d if uh, a plus d equals c plus b. All right. Or b plus c. Doesn't matter. Okay. So that was the idea. And let's do this interactively. Okay, this I could probably have typed faster myself without asking Ida to refine the whole for me, but okay, now it's good. Okay, so what did I say? A plus D equals, uh, let's say B plus C, looks nicer. Okay, so that was easy. Um, I guess, like, to convince ourselves that this is actually the integers and, and not just some random funny type that I uh, defined, we should uh, have a bunch of exercises. Exercise uh, prove uh, like this is equivalent to the integers as we used them before, um, as like a pos and an exact constructor or dance integers. Um, maybe also um, define uh, zero, one, plus, minus, times. Improve standard properties. That could be another um, exercise. Uh, do that for Z prime. Um, could be fun. But also, well, okay, no. Fine, you can do it directly, or you could use the fact that you've proved this equivalence and you can transport them over. And that's what I'm going to talk a bit about next time. But uh, that may not um, get ahead of myself now. Um, but anyway, so you see, I mean, this quotient, pretty easy to define, pretty easy to use, nice. Um, we'll see how, you'll see yourself how nice it is to work with this kind of um, type if you try to do these things, but uh, it's not too bad. Um, but I kind of think the other integers is easier to work with because you don't have to worry about any higher paths and so on. <laughs> but you can work with this one. Mm. All right, so that was that, and we answered the two questions about what happens if you, uh, yeah, you have a set, not a set, and so on. Um, good. Um, and yes, let me continue here. Yeah, uh, similarly, we can define uh, the rational numbers. Um, as a quotient of, uh, yeah, pairs of a number. Someone in the Q&A also suggested Z bot n. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's also nice. Yeah. Can also do, yeah, Z bot n. Um, and so, and we can define the rational numbers. Uh, <coughs> and so on. You can take up your, your favorite introductory textbooks to math and formalize a bunch of numbers like this. Um, that's nice. Um, I guess I wanted to say something more about the rational numbers. So um, yeah, uh, what did I want to say? Mm. Oh yeah, okay. So I mean, right. So what I want to say is like, uh, yeah, all of these, like the integers and the rationals and Z mod N and so on uh, can be defined uh, without quotients in type theory. Um, so you might wonder like, why would you want to do it this way? I mean, first of all, you can kind of do it the mathy way. I mean, you could do this more generally, define the field of fractions of a ring and so on and get the 
the <coughs> rational numbers that way, but you can also, there are also other benefits that are maybe more um, uh, practical. Uh, but uh, so what I want to say, uh, the quotient definition is sometimes more efficient. So the example is uh, we take the rationals. So, uh, so if you define this, Okay, so Q can be defined not as a quotient by taking uh, pairs of co-prime numbers, right? So essentially, I mean, this is, uh, what is it called? It's normalized fractions. So, uh, I guess the, another term for the same thing, uh, co-prime numbers. So that's like, as normalized fractions. So you just take the fractions that are normal lives. So this uh, kind of represent the normal forms the rational numbers in normal forms. And this is fine, you can define it in normal type theory and it doesn't involve any quotients. Uh, problem, uh, need to uh, normalize constantly. Like, I don't know, let's say I take a, take a sum of rational numbers, like every addition I do in this sum, I always have to compute some GCDs, remove common divisors, etc., etc. So um, it gets kind of expensive. Um, with the quotient definition, uh, we don't have to normalize unless we want to. As we're working with, um, I mean, the what do you call it? Equivalence classes. I mean, the images of the this map, right? And there is no need to normalize that unless, like, unless we want to. So then you can first like compute this sum of rational numbers and then normalize in the end if you want a smaller result or Maybe you want to have a big result and use it for something else. So, uh, so there are also like practical uh, pros with using the quotient definition. So, uh, yeah, practical benefits with quotients um, can get more efficient because you don't have to normalize. And I don't know if you like programming languages, you can think of other examples like this, like you take, uh, I don't know, simply type lambda calculus, modulo, uh, beta equality, eta equality, and so on. And if you do it like as a, as a quotient, you don't have to normalize your terms all the time. You can work with the non-normalized terms and it can get more efficient. So um, yeah. And if you want to know more of this kind of example, I recommend you talk to Astra because she knows a lot about it. Okay, so that uh, is cool. Actually, we um, have one more, one yeah. more question. Is, uh, since we don't require R to be an, an, an equivalence relation, will A mod R be the quotient by the equivalence relation generated by R? Uh, Right, in this definition, right. So because I haven't taken this to be an equivalence relation. Um, so, so if A is a set and R is prop valued, but it's not an equivalence relation, then, uh, right, then the you get something like effectivity, but for the equivalence relation generated by R. Oh, yeah. Yeah, something like that. So yeah, but in general, A doesn't have to be a set. So there's an extra quotient going on. Maybe it factors through the quotient by the equivalence relation generated through it. I think if A is a set and R is prop valued, then the kernel pair of the inclusion is the free equivalence relation on R. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Right. But I guess I should say, like, I mean, you can form this type. This very general way, but to prove many lemmas, you of course need to assume more properties on, on at least on R. Uh, but I kind of like when you do the construction, I like to have the minimal set of assumptions because it's kind of easier for a user. Here I just had to plug in my relation and take the quotient. If I would have required that this is prop valued and an equivalence relation, I would have had to write like, I don't know, 10 more lines of code here. So Kind of like this, you get the definition quickly and then separately you can prove that this relation is an equivalence relation and so on. So you can apply the general lemmas. So I like to kind of decouple things. Um, I guess this is also quite 
common in the style I like to formalize things. Like many times you have some predicate or relation that is prop valued, but I really like to not view it as a map into H prop, but rather a map into type with a separate proof that it's a proposition because then it gets kind of easier to work with um, once you're doing more complicated things. Um, but now I'm going on a kind of a, yeah, off track. But if you want to do more math like this, you might want to remember this advice. Um, like keep the properties separate from the structure. Um, good. Yes. Nice. Um, Cool, and this is taking slightly longer than I had anticipated, but uh, I think I'm gonna continue because I will to show you another cool set quotient. Um. <clears throat> All right, um, okay, another example, finite multisets. And this is maybe more of a maybe computer science example. Um, so the idea is you wanna take lists modulo permutation essentially so you get finite sets where you can repeat the elements of the set okay so let's call them fm set and you want to take the so this is like the, the carrier the elements of the lists essentially uh, and i'm not gonna define it the way i did the, well, where is it? The integers using the, the general set quotient construction. Instead, I'm just going to write it as a higher inductive type, but I'll throw in a set truncation. And I'm going to talk about why I'm doing it this way soon. But anyway, so like I said, it's going to be lists. So let's take the standard list constructors, uh, nil and cons. Uh, oops, why am I typing? Okay. Uh, okay, so now we have lists, and I said I want to um, mod out the uh, permutations, so essentially swapping elements, um, and then you can construct more complicated permutations by composing various swappings. So let's do it like this, com, so I want to swap out commuting elements, and I'm going to do it this way. So I just want to say that x cons y cons x's is the same as y cons x cons x's. And now I need to give the infix operation a fixity, and I picked five for some reason, and now I guess happy. Okay, good. All right, so now I'm modeled out by swapping elements, and you can kind of imagine that if you compose this thing and uh, with app, app it and compose it and so on, you get kind of more complicated permutations generated by this swapping. Uh, and then I also need to truncate it. It's like about so. All right. So what did I want to say? Um, so this is kind of a nice little small example. Um, I didn't do it using uh, the quotient. Uh, so I didn't use uh, like general set quotient uh, because uh, it gets a bit more annoying, uh, a bit longer and annoying to do it that way. Um, you can try it and you'll see it gets more annoying. It's kind of nice to just have this one constructor. Also uh, nice to have a simple, uh, path constructor com to pattern match up. Because like if we would use this general quotient thing, we would only we would get the, the the path constructors that I had upstairs. Here we get this nice com constructor instead. So sometimes you want to use the general one because probably you have nice lemmas proved about it. And sometimes you want to do something more ad hoc like this and define the thing you want. Okay, <clears throat> so let me now show how we write some code with this. And now I'm gonna infix R30. Um, I just copy pasted these examples from 
the cubicle like the library. So I assume the fixities make a lot of sense, maybe. So let's define plus plus. So that's just consing or um, how do you say concatenation of two finite multisets. <clears throat> and like we saw last time, we can plug in. Um, yeah, we can ask Agda to the case split force. Oop. Things get yellow and so on, but we can ignore it. So how do we cons the empty set to bias? We just return the bias. Here we keep the x and recurse to the cons, uh, concatenate, sorry. And now things get more interesting. So let's see if I can increase the font here so I can see what I'm gonna type or solve. So now we have a slightly more complicated um, um, example of where we need to fill a hole involving a, a path constructor, like a cubicle path constructor. And we see here like this guy takes x, y, x's, and i, which is this interval variable. And we need to produce something in fm set of a. <clears throat> um, but what is it we want to produce? We want to produce something which at i equals 0 is x cons y cons x's plus plus y's, and at i1 is y cons x cons x's plus plus y's. And we have a constructor that does this for us, like this permutation of two, two concepts, it's just com. You can com x, y, and then the remainder uh, multisets is just x s plus plus y s, and then we plug in the i. And this thing here is, an, well, if you do it this way, we see it's a path from this to this, which is really what we want in the end. And if we apply it to i, uh, we'll have an element with the correct boundary. And Okay, so that was easy. Now it's getting less easy. Um, well, let me see what. <laughs> you don't yeah. have your is set is square p lemma in prelude? Uh, I do. So I, I just wanted to show this looks scary. Um, so what do we wanna do? We wanna construct some square with a specified boundary. And in this case, we can actually do it if we're a bit clever um, and we can kind of type it up using the trunk constructor. But very often this gets, uh, very quickly, this gets very annoying. Um, and also we're writing a map into a set and a set essentially says that any square can be filled in a set. And in the library, we have general lemmas for like, okay, if I know that something is a set, I can fill any square, so just give me the boundary of your square and I'll give you a filler. So this kind of whole um, looks scary when you see it like this, um, but if you have good lemmas, um, you just use the lemma everywhere. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, okay, I'm just gonna leave this hole for now and you can trust me, it can be filled uh, because it's not very instructive to fill it live. Now, um, or, or okay, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cheat. Aha. I have my answers here, and I'm just gonna copy paste the filler here. And oh no, not in scope. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Let me, I renamed things. Sorry. Okay. So here's the solution. Don't worry too much about it. Um, you can look at it, but like I said, there are nice lemmas in the library that lets you get away with not having to write these kind of things. But um, yeah, I figured I, I I'll show I'd show you that you can fill this kind of hole if you're clever, but uh, you don't want to do it uh, this way. Okay, but now that we filled it, we can prove a few lemmas, um, like some unit lemma. Non trivial one. So, <clears throat> um, all right, we want to prove that if you concatenate with the empty set on the right, you get the same thing back. 
and this is the one that doesn't hold definitionally because we didn't pattern match on y as here, right? So here we have to do some work and we do it by pattern matching. In this case, it's trivial. Um, here you, yeah, you want to use the induction hypothesis to simplify these things and app on X. Uh, here, so. Okay. And then we get to these things and uh, yeah, you kind of do the same thing. You just have to trust me on this for now, uh, but I'm gonna show you that you don't. Did I do this the right way? Oh, it gets more annoying. Okay, well, I'm just gonna show you that you can do this. And then once again, there will be nice lemmas in the library that lets you avoid all this thing because now this goal is a total nightmare. Look, yeah, so let's not do it. Let me just show you what the nice proof looks like. Um, and I put it here. So if you have good lemmas, you can essentially do this thing in a one-liner um, where we have some special eliminator, just like the eliminator you saw for high inductive types before, but this is an eliminator for eliminating into propositions. And here we're eliminating into proposition because the image is an equality or the, the codomain is an equality in a set, which is a proposition. And in a proposition, any two, like all, Paths are trivial, right? So um, we only need to give the first two cases, these two. Oh, and this should be app. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, so my point is um, you can write this kind of um, high inductive types, uh, but you should look at how things have been set up in the library to make things nicer. So. Uh, you can do set quotients this way, but need good lemmas and combinators. Uh, because otherwise, yeah, you have to fill this kind of very scary holes and you shouldn't do that. So good. So if you want to do like, I don't know, various data structures like this uh, or other things where you just kind of write down a higher inductive type, um, like this in set truncate, you should look at how we've been doing it in the library because that will save you a lot of time. So that was the take home message here. Um, very good. Okay. And are there any questions about this or should I jump to the next uh, thing I have? Uh, so in the notes, uh, there's some more efficient notation of f and set, uh, but I don't have time to cover it. But I don't, I, I'm not going to cover it now, but you can read it about it in the notes, but you can do something more efficient than this. Um, okay, but uh, any questions? There Before. don't appear to be any at the moment. Very good. So, <clears throat> so what did I tell you? Set quotients, uh, either use uh, the general set quotient, uh, get good lemmas. Uh, if you use a library, of course, you get good lemmas, uh, but maybe not the constructors you want, right? Uh, or uh, write your own, like I did with FM set. Uh, need to prove prove good lemmas uh, but they are easy uh, or maybe not easy but let's call them their boilerplate once you know what you're doing uh, or if you can look at some other code um, <clears throat> uh, but get good constructors to pattern match on so if you want to like formalize i don't know your favorite quotient. Um, yeah, you essentially have these two choices and 
yeah, I just wanted to give you some kind of hints what you should do. And if you try one and run into problems, you can try with the other. Um, right. Okay, good. But that was the general thing I wanted to say about set quotients. If you want to um, do some on your own. So now let's move on to tubercle transport and path induction, in, unless anyone has any <coughs> questions. <coughs> All right, I'm going to bring some water first. Um, All right, so uh, yeah, last time we saw that we can prove many things uh, for path types, essentially, using uh, the operations on the interval, like, uh, you know, this reversal. I, I kind of skipped over it, but if you read the notes, you also saw this uh, min and max operations. Okay, so you can do a bunch of things with just like the primitive structure on the interval, <coughs> but uh, we cannot yet compose paths uh, or transport along paths or, uh, yeah, or uh, prove things by path induction. So, like, you can do a bunch of things, but there are a bunch of many things we can't do. So now I'm going to talk about what we need to do um, these other things that you want to do with paths, right? So let's start with transport. All right. So uh, basic operation in cubicle lagda for transport is called transp. Okay, and we saw it very briefly. Last week, I kind of just typed it in, said we'll talk about it later, and that's what I'm going to do now. Um, but it's a form of generalized cubical transport operation. So given a, a path of types, you kind of get a fancy function between them. Um, okay, so, so a special case is uh, cubical transport. Maybe we could call it path transport or something, um, which I'm going to call transport. Uh, despite it being slightly confusing, because so up until now, transport in Bukot, the way we've seen it before, has had a slightly more complicated type. But in cubicle type theory, and like in cubicle Agda, and many of the papers on cubicle type theory in cubicle Agda, the, the basic operation is this form of transport, uh, cubicle transport. I'm just going to call it transport from now on. So now, from now on, Transport is just a function that takes a path and essentially gives you a function from A to B. So it gives you a path from A to B and turns it into a function. <coughs> okay, and like I said, the, the basic operation or primitive operation is called transp. So all of these various forms of transport that we want to do are derived from this one thing. And let me just type it in and then I'll talk about it. Okay, so transp essentially takes three arguments. Um, or maybe I shouldn't have typed it so fast. Let's see what happens if I put transp here and press this. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so what is the type of transp? Uh, the type is kind of gnarly. It gives a, a line of levels and some stuff. So let me write the simplified form of this type. Um, okay, so in general, uh, trans pass this slightly simplified type. So, so we're given a line A, well, that's not a line. So when I just have something like this, just a function from I into something, I call it the line in the thing. Um, so this is a line of types. A is a line of types. And some element R in the interval and an element A at big A applied to zero 
and we get an element at big A applied to one. Okay. <clears throat> so here, um, yeah, if, if we would delete this thing, this would probably not be too weird, right? I mean, it's essentially giving us something in a function type and giving us, uh, us something like this. Um, but if we, yeah, let's do it like this, then it's just confusing. Okay, but uh, this R thing here is uh, kind of funny. Um, so, so the R, let's just specify where the transp is uh, the identity function, which sounds kind of bizarre, but uh, it's useful for kind of technical reasons. We'll see some examples soon, but uh, that's really what it does. And for this to make sense, A has to be constant uh, on uh, R, so to say, or like constant whenever R is one, right? Um, okay, so this is kind of confusing and weird. First time you see it, probably the second time as well. Um, and it's there for kind of technical reasons, but we will see soon that it's kind of useful to specify when this function is the identity. Um, and in this case, like we plugged in uh, the left endpoint zero for R and so this essentially tells us this function is not constant, uh, not the identity anywhere, essentially. Um, okay. And we had to beta expand the P here because here it's a path, but it wants uh, a line. So okay. to make Agda happy, we need to beta expand. Um, except apart from that, it's not too weird and like, the type of this trans blah, 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 zero like this will be a map from whatever input we put uh, applied to zero uh, to something and this thing applied to one. So in this case, this was a path from A to B. So if you apply it to zero, it's something from A uh, to the thing applied to one, which is B. So it's a function from A to B. Okay. Um, good. I guess. And just to connect to the, the hot lectures, the transp is like, uh, I believe what Egbert calls transport, but for a type family over the interval, right? So normally transport is like, if you have a, if you have a family of types, you know, indexed by another type and you have a path in the domain, you know, from X to Y, then you get a function from the, from the X fiber of the family to the Y fiber of the family. So this is like that, but for a family specifically over the interval. And then the thing that you called transport, that, that was transp. And then the thing that you called transport is like uh, <laughs> the hot transport, <laughs> but for the identity family. Uh, family, for the family, you know, lambda x dot x. Yeah. So the book hot's transp is called substant cubicle agda, and it might be worthwhile just giving the definition and seeing how it unfolds. Yes, I was going to do that next. I also realized it's kind of confusing to call this A when I have an A here. So let me just call this guy P or whatever. Maybe L for line. That's confusing. Is, is A equal to path B in A from AI0 to AI1? Wait, what? Is the, is the line A the same thing as a path? Um, Path oh, so a, uh, they're asking the about the um, why you had to inline the lambda i p of i is the question as well. Right. So if I would put just p here, that's what someone wants to see. Then Agda gets mad um, for, I don't know if it's good or bad reasons, but for some reasons. Um, and you kind of need to it expand it because this expects something of this type and it doesn't exactly match this. But if you it expand it, Agda will see that it does match. Um, yeah, that's a bit of an annoying thing. But very often when you use transp, you need to expand the first argument. Um, an equality is not exactly a function from the interval. More of yeah, it exactly. behaves like it. You can evaluate on interval variables, but not exactly. 
Yeah, exactly. Because it has the side conditions that, you know, when you apply it to zero, you get the left endpoint. And if you apply it to one, you get the right endpoint. So this kind of eta expanding here kind of forgets about that stuff. And you let's act the view it as a function. It's a little bizarre, um, but it's just yeah, the it's way it is. Reason. It's a good technical reason, but it's a, it's a bad reason in general. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but. And when I say like the R lets us specify where the transp is the identity function. So this really, what I mean is like, if I do transp L I one A, this is, what did you call it? Uh, is it dot e? Oh, dot yeah. e, here we go. So this is really just like the thing you plugged in again. So it doesn't do anything whenever R is one. Okay. So that's what I mean when I say transp is the identity function. Um, okay. <coughs> yes. Um, but now I'm going to show you subs, then hopefully it will be. Well, cool. Where is my subs? Ah, here it is. Okay. So let's look. So what was subs? So, okay. So uh, what we cubists called subs, uh, who called? calls transport. Okay, so subst, or at least some of us cubists, cubists from Sweden maybe. Um, anyway, um, so, so given a family of types B, um, X, Y, and A, and if we have a, I'm just gonna type everything that I'm gonna talk because I can't type and talk at the same time. Now I'm doing it anyway. Uh, okay, good. Whew. I managed to type it. Um, okay, so this is the thing you've probably uh, heard being called transport before, but because like this form of just turning a, a, a line into a function is kind of the natural thing to first define when you're working cubically, when you start with a different primitive than in Bukot, um, we call this thing transport. And then this derived thing that you, we're gonna derive from transport, we call that subst. Um, and then, well, there's a slightly <coughs> confusing terminology, um, but uh, yeah, it's the uh, way it is. And so how, how are we gonna prove this? Okay. So like I said, so we're going to derive it from transport. And transport takes some junk, but in particular, it takes a path. So let me just refine. That is always good. Um, so essentially, what we want to do is we want to transport this bx over to by in the family that equates bx to by, right? That would do it. So if I plug in bx here, we know that. And now, Agda got some more information. So Agda knows, okay, we want to connect BX to BY. How are we going to do that? Well, there are different ways. Um, we could try with app B on P. Let's see if it works. Yeah, it worked. Okay. Yeah, sometimes I'm afraid uh, to type things in without ADA expanding first, but in this case, uh, Agda managed to get it to work because this is actually not, I mean, here it expects a, a path, not a line. So anyway, so. <clears throat> so we managed to derive like Bukot transport, which we're going to call subst um, from the transport operation and app. And I guess I stress suggested we look at the normal form. So let's normalize it. Huh, it's not, I don't know how helpful this is, but it essentially unfolds down to transp. So transp, I said it's the primitive. Now we see it's the primitive because it's the thing that your transports unfold to like that's where I can't go further than this at this point because it's the primitive thing and it's just a, a transport in this which is the unfolded um, like remember how we defined app last week and it's just uh, uh, last on Monday this is what the unfolding of app looks like cool um very good let's just see Okay, let me show you the following. 
example, which is kind of hopefully gonna give you an idea why we need this weird stuff with the R as an argument to transp. So um, because we are not defining things by uh, path induction, uh, transport uh, along refo uh, isn't the identity function in general. So we need to prove it. So let me state it and you'll see what I mean by this. If you don't see what I'm Okay, so like in Bookot, we could just plug in refl here, right? Because like subst or transport, if you plug in refl, you like, because it's defined by pattern matching or path induction on the path, it computes definitionally or judgmentally. Here, it's not defined that way. It was defined this way in terms of transp and transp doesn't reduce on refl for uh, very technical terms. I think there was some discussion at some point about something called regularity. You might want to dig it up in the chat if you want, but it's essentially the property, well, one name for the property that this holds definitionally. Um, some people, um, me included, called it regularity a long time ago. Um, anyway, so, but like, okay, so this this doesn't hold by refl. Let's, let's just show you that it doesn't, okay, so. Agda tells us this doesn't fill the hole because this thing is not this thing. So that doesn't work. So what can we do? Well, um, what we want to do is connect transp in a constant A uh, with I0 for R, X to X. And we can do this the following way. So we can put, oh yeah, I'm gonna need the A on the right-hand side. So let me get it. Okay, so now it looks slightly, let me normalize the code. Oh, that didn't help. Um, well, maybe it does, yeah, it does. Okay, so we wanna relate trans, essentially in REFL or constantly A, I zero X to X um, along I. So let's do it this way. Okay, something X. Okay, Agda is happy. So what can we put here? So remember, like when I is zero, this should be I zero. And when I is one, the whole thing should go away. So if you just plug in I, this is gonna work because we had this funny computation rule that whenever the thing, like the second argument, the R is one, this is the identity function. So it definitely reduces. So we get some kind of, very, very special form of this regularity, maybe you could think like in a special case, transport reduces definitionally. Um, let me, oops, like plug this thing in here again and we see. Okay, well, that just doesn't help so much because Agda doesn't show us the boundary, but it has this boundary because, like, when I is zero, like when we're in this case, we clearly have this, right? I mean, that's essentially what I plugged in. If you substitute I zero for I, you have this thing. And then when I is one, we have this thing because the computation rule up here would trigger in that case. So this is uh, maybe one way to see why we need this funny generalized operation. Um, and if you think very hard, you, yeah, you see like if you only had the transport as primitive, we wouldn't be able to get this for free or, or not for free by proof um, to, to get this thing. Okay. Um, I have half an hour left and I have so much I want to say. Um, okay. But so this was cool, I hope. So you can derive it. So I guess I could also talk a bit about that fact. So you can, I mean, Uh, so you have to prove like manually that transporting along REFL is the identity function. Um, this 
make some things that hold definitionally in Bukot, obviously not hold definitionally here. I mean, in particular, this equation doesn't hold definitionally. Um, so some proofs do get a little bit annoying and you need to plug in some transport reference manually. Um, so that is one drawback by, by working cubically. But in many cases, you actually like this kind of equation never pops up if you do proofs in a very cubical style. So it's not too bad, I would say, or it's not very bad at all. Kind of rare. You can grip for transport reference in the cubicle library and you won't see too many examples, I think. Um, okay. Um, but having said all this, um, I now want to show you that we can uh, prove path induction. So, uh, right, so path induction is not a primitive concept in cubicle like that. Rather, uh, we have to prove it. And the idea is um, you can derive, so like general fact, I don't know if you've seen this in the, in the hot track, but there's a general fact saying, if you have subs plus contractibility of singletons, which I didn't really, uh, show you last time i skipped over it but it was one of the exercises and i'm gonna show it to you briefly now uh, this implies um, path induction so essentially what this means if you have some general equality type that has a subst or book hot transport operation and satisfies the contractibility of singletons then you can derive path induction um, and doing this I guess it's a nice exercise, um, but I figure I'll, I'll show it to you um, because it's quite nice fact. And also, I don't know if you know, but uh, path induction uh, has traditionally been called J in the type theory community. So you might see people talk hear people talk about J or read about something called J. That's just path induction. You might have heard this, but I'm saying it again. Uh, and you might then hear about some axiom called K, which is equivalent to every type being a set. Um, and that's uh, called that way because it's the next letter of the J, I think, in the alphabet. So maybe not the best reason to name your ax axiom K, but uh, anyway. So I'm going to prove J because it's shorter than path induction. So what is the type of path induction? So, yeah. So now, like in, when you work in normal Agda, or uh, Agda the way Dan and Martin did it, non-cubical Agda, um, you never have to prove path induction because you have pattern matching. So you don't have to write, to write out the term and use it explicitly, you instead just pattern match on your, on your paths or equalities, but in, uh, because we want to prove it here, we of course need to give it a type and it's going to be kind of the same type as you've seen in the hot track, like the pen and paper track. So what does it say? So we have some X in our type A and then a type family P over some Y and a path from X to Y. Okay. And then we have a proof, let's let me write them like this, all the arguments, then it kind of reads like a typing rule. Um, so D says that P at X um, holds for F all. And then we can derive that for any Y, oops, wrong kind of brace, uh, and we can conclude that PYP holds. Let's see if I got this right. So we're essentially saying like, we have this type family over elements of A and paths like this um, that holds a treffle. So if we can prove that this holds a treffle, then we can prove that it holds anywhere for any Y that is connected to, to the X, right? Um, 
good. Let's put all of these on the left hand side of the equality and try to prove this now. Um, so how would you go ahead and prove something like this from uh, subst and contractible singletons? So what does the contractible singletons say? So let's throw it in as a lemma. Well, so this is ugly, but I'm gonna fix the type here. Why is Agda confused now? <laughs> okay, let me type it in. Let's see if I can. Uh -huh. uh, you... You, need, you need to introduce A. Oh, thank you. Like this. Yeah, Agda doesn't like it when you give. Ah, yeah. Especially in a hole that mentions a generic variable. Uh, maybe L as well. Oh, no. <laughs> No, you don't need to give L unless you want to declare it in. Yeah, it's bizarre. Okay, well. It's because you have. <laughs> okay, let's <laughs> let's let's do it this way. Bam! Here we go. So are. is contour singleton takes an implicit parameter that's a right? If you put yeah. in the whole a for specified thing, it'll just elaborate that implicit. Oh, I see. But I but I could also just jump to the definition, um, like this. So what does it say? So it essentially says that this type single of singletons, so essentially sigma x in A such that A equals x. So given an A in A is, is essentially like you have a point A and everything that is connected to it by a path. The space of all of those things um, is contractible. This is sometimes called the vacuum cleaning cord principle, like you pull everything to the center. Um, and it's also sometimes called base path induction. Um, that's probably the name you've seen before, but I like calling it contractible singletons. Um, yes, and you can prove it. I, I just skipped over this proof before, and I'm not going to do it now either. But essentially, the most interesting thing about this proof in cubic lagda is that it uses one of these, the min operation on the interval. Okay, but for now, just trust me uh, that we have it. Okay. Let's see if this works. Oh no, what is X? Oh, I need the X as well for my proof. Ah, oh, shit. Yeah, sorry. Exactly happier now. Ah, okay, very good. <laughs> um, and let me unfold this. Uh, oh no, this is a special colon, colon four. <laughs> This is the way it is, right? Okay, good. Um, okay, so we, we know that this type is contractible. Um, so that's what we have. And we're gonna use it to prove this PYP. And I said, we're gonna prove it with a subst. And we're gonna, yeah. I'm just gonna plug this in because now I got so the idea is essentially, what do we want to do? We want to like take our p x refl here and kind of drag it out so that it's uh, or like move it over. So like you use p to kind of transport the x into a y, and then you use this contractibility of singletons to turn the refl, which is the center of contraction for this proof, into p. Okay. Um, yeah. So I don't know how helpful this is going to be, but I'm going to do it this way. Okay. So, like, we want to do a substance on sigma type. The sigma type is this thing. Like I just said, like, we want to turn our x into y and the refl into p. So, we're going to work in this sigma type but because we can't like p is something that doesn't take a sigma type you need to kind of uncurry the input a bit but if we do that now this is very readable suddenly the goal so we just want to pass from x comma refl to y and p and that's um, the second component 
of these incontractable singletons, like the fact that this, you want a connection between two paths. So I get out the, the second component and it's a proof that Prefl connects to whatever I plug in and I plug in this thing. Um, probably this went a bit too fast if you haven't seen it before. So I suggest you try to prove it yourself, throw away my proof and you try to do it yourself and see if you can make sense of it. Um, it's probably also like helpful to do this in book hot, just like in regular Agda or even on paper, prove that subs, well, I guess the, the, the book hot version would be something like transport plus uh, based path induction implies what uh, path induction, right? Like full path induction. Um, good, but I guess the point is you can prove it and the proof look kind of gnarly because I made it look a bit gnarly, but uh, I mean, it's at least short, um, that's good. And um, now that we have it, we can do all of our proofs using J, uh, which is path induction. Uh, and uh, like do our, our proofs, book out style, um, and be happy with that. However, uh, this kind of gets annoying because uh, a little bit annoying to use. To use because uh, it doesn't satisfy the computation rule at REFL. So, you know, it's not defined by pattern matching like you would in Bookout if you would write this down. Uh, or, well, like most things in Bookout, I mean, subs isn't defined by pattern matching. So, it would be kind of stuck whenever you want to, like, whenever thinks this P is REFL. Um, it won't rep definitionally return the D. So that's a bit annoying. So we try to avoid it. Also, uh, uh, can lead to very big terms uh, when you unfold, well, you, when Agda unfolds things. So it's kind of bad. So this is bad for readability and efficiency because. Agda can get kind of like, once you start doing more complicated things, if you're not careful, um, Agda can get very slow. Um, so, um, and- Can you want we to see be... what the normalized proof term for J looks like? Oh yeah, that, that's probably, that's much simpler than what I typed here, by the way. Um, ah, uh, it doesn't look so simple, but uh, so it's essentially a transp in a fancy family um, of the D. So essentially a transport of P applied to PI. And PI was a path from X to Y. So this is really, well, this is really a path from X to Y. And then this thing is something from REFL to uh, P. Um, and this min operation that pops up here comes from the min operation that pops up in the middle of the proof of its contra single. So uh, yeah, if you want to, digest this in your own time um, or yeah kind of try to understand that proof um, but yeah this so you see the normal form is not too bad but still like if you plug in a complex p the trans will kind of blow up inside of agda and you get something very complicated and because of that we often try to not use uh, J unless we have to. So often it's better to avoid J and stick to cubicle primitives directly. Um, so, so, so far we've seen this transp operation and well, it's good to use it, but um, the cubicle primitive I have in mind is the last thing I'm gonna talk about today. And we'll see how far I get because I have 14 minutes left, but uh, at least I'll get started. Uh, I just want to interject really quickly that I, th I think uh, there's, well, maybe there's different terminology, but I think what you've called J is normally what's called based path induction. Um, and singleton oh. tractability 
Yeah, so so I think the book hot version would be transport plus singleton contractibility implies based path induction. Um, ah, yeah. And also a separate fact is that like based path induction and path induction imply each other. Um, okay. Yeah, but I mean, er, technically everything you said was, yeah, was right. Yes, I just uh, don't remember the terminology because I haven't read the book out in in a very long time. <laughs> so yes, thank you, Carlo, for clarifying this. So this is a French called base path induction. For some reason, I thought singleton contractibility was base path induction, but anyway. Well, uh, this is base path induction because the 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 type family <sighs> is like has one fixed endpoint x. Oh, the so normal right. path induction is p. Uh, yeah, capital P uh, quantifies over both x and y and the path. Okay, I think uh, yeah. Hopefully, things are a lot less confusing now uh, after Carlo intervened in my confusing terminology. Um, very good, thank you, Carlo. Um, okay, now all the people want to hear about uh, HCOMP because they don't know it's good for them. So uh, <laughs> let's see what we can get to. Yeah, <laughs> and we've got to do it very fast. We have 12 minutes. No, but. Uh, I'm going to start now and see how far I get, and then I'm probably going to say some more things in the beginning of next time. So, right. So this is uh, the last part of today, which I wasn't sure if I was going to cover. But essentially, um, so like I said, we want to avoid J, based path production, <laughs> and uh, instead stick to um, cubicle primitive. So we had the trans primitive I introduced, um, but the other primitive, which some of you already um, was unintentionally exposed to in the last uh, exercise set is the HCOMP operation. So HCOMP is short for homogeneous composition, which is a way of composing um, essentially higher dimensional cubes to make more complicated cubes. And the most like simple case of a well, a simple k, well, okay, a lower dimensional cube, like a one dimensional cube is just a line. So the special case, case is uh, path composition. And that's the one I want to show you. Mm, right. So let's do it. Oops. Okay, so this is what I mean when I say path compositions. You want to compose a path from X to Y, a path from Y to Z to get a path from X to Z. Um, so we could, of course, use my J up here, but like I said, we don't want to do that because uh, um, when you unfold it, you get bad things. Um, and <clears throat> Let's do it another way and use this other primitive. So this is always kind of a pain to explain and it looks extremely scary first time you see it, but then at some point you get the geometric picture and suddenly it makes sense. Um, but I think I'm gonna copy paste the picture first before trying to type the term. Oh wait, these are the wrong lecture notes. Here we go, right, lecture notes and I brought, made some very beautiful, ASCII art, which I'm gonna copy paste here because it's gonna be helpful. Delete some junk. Okay, so the idea is we wanna compose the path P and Q uh, to get a path from X to Z, right? And the way you do this is using this H comp operation, which takes in this kind of open box, like this shape here. We call it an open box because it's kind of a, well, in this case, it's, it's, it's a very degenerate box. It's like an open square. A square is a very low dimensional box. And it's open because like this part is missing, right? There's nothing there, but you can still form this kind of box by putting the P here, the Q there, and then ruffle here, or just an X here. Like constantly X, I'm gonna draw that way. And in the drawing, I is going left to right and J is going uh, 
down to up. Some people like to draw this up to down, but I'm sticking to, I'm going up. Okay, so that's the idea. And then when you like H comp this shape, you get something, well, now this gets kind of ugly, but you, it will soon be pretty. You get something up here, so just uh, H comp of this whole square. Um, so that's the idea. Um, so you start with some kind of well-shaped open box. You can kind of imagine what the three-dimensional version of this would be. You would have a square in the bottom and then four squares on the sides and then no lid of your box. So that's kind of the uh, where that terminology of open box comes. Then in four dimensions, it's getting harder to imagine, but you have a cube in the bottom and then you plug in cubes on all the three sides. And five dimensions, I'm not even gonna try, but uh, nice thing is we have syntax, so we don't have to draw pictures in very high dimensions if you don't like that. So, okay, so how do we like type this kind of shape into Agda? Um, and the way we do it is essentially, so all of these open boxes always have a base, right? So that is one specified argument. And then this, they have this kind of list of sides. In this case, we have two sides. Um, for a cube, we would have four sides. For a three cube or a four cube, we would have a more sides. Uh, I'm not going to try to count them now live, but uh, yeah, you get a lot of sides. So like you always have one base, but you have many sides. I guess that's the message. So an operation like this would have to take one specified element, which is the base, and then a list of elements, which is the sides. Um, so that's what hcomp does. It takes two arguments, first the sides and then the base. So let's start with the base because it's the least, the, the least scary of these. So the base is just P at I in my drawing. So I guess happy with that. Now we need to specify the, the list of sides. But as you see, the type is not, it's not an Agda list type. It's some kind of weird function out of I into dot is one, whatever junk this is into A. Um, and so the I here is kind of the specified direction that we're doing the H comp in. In this case, I call it J. Uh, oops, stop. Okay, means I have five minutes left. So I'm gonna finish this example and then I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, but then you'll have the idea of how you write your own H comps, but I'm probably gonna show you more examples later. Anyway, um, so, so the I here, like this interval variable that this whole wants is the thing I'm calling J here. So uh, let's abstract it. Okay. Now Agda wants some scary stuff. And this has to do with, um, uh, like to understand this type, I would have to explain a bunch of other things, um, which I'm not gonna do now because I don't have time, but I'm gonna show you a way to input something that has this type. And then you can either look in the documentation or I try to explain it next week. Okay, um, and now let me indent things so that it gets slightly more readable. So here down here, we have the base still, and here I've inputted a function, which is this, what this is. So remember this was something like of type dot is one, some weird phi thing. And that's essentially, the phi essentially specifies the boundary where we have sides. So here we have two sides. So it's really, uh, specified by I or not I, essentially. So, um, which is true, which is one when I is zero or I is one. And we can write this kind of nicely in line with a pattern matching lambda like this. Um, can also lift it out as a separate definition if you want, um, but I'm gonna do it this way. So this is, I mean, one way to think of this is like a fancy list of, list of pairs where the first argument is like where do we put the thing on the base? And uh, the other argument is what is the thing? Okay, because in this case here, we need to say like this X line here, we attach it 
when i equals zero to the left endpoint and the q at j thing we attach when i is one and that's essentially what these two things here say okay so now we look at our picture this one's something in a and that's i can take oops i need to introduce x and now my indentation is all messed up but i'll fix it very quickly okay now i can put x here bam and here i said i wanted q of j yeah and i is happy and yeah so that was kind of very quick uh, introduction to hcomp um, and i'm probably going to say more things later um, I guess one can have many questions about what I've just said. Um, for example, why do you define path composition with by having the P here and the Q here? Why not like putting the P there and the Q there or the Q there and the P there and yeah, so on. And there are many variations, like all of these three things you can write down. Maybe it's a good exercise to write them all down and you can prove them all equal, but that's a much harder exercise. Um, but you can look in the cubicle library and there are nice uh, lemmas about it. Um, we just had an excellent question. Doesn't yes. what you just did look like pattern matching on the interval? Why can you pattern match on the interval? Oh, yeah, that is a very good question. Um, yes. So, <laughs> and the answer is uh, okay. I bet. Uh, um yes it definitely looks like a pattern matching on the interval but under the hood i'm not like i haven't written like um i haven't written like simply i zero i one and apply this thing to i here that wouldn't work okay but i can't even write this but like this is some special syntactic sugar which when you unfold it turns into one of these is ones which is something you can pattern match on um right well it's, it's not a pattern match way. i mean this yeah well it is a pattern matching lambda in a literal sense but another way is um if we're not actually it's not an interval variable that's being split on uh if you have an interval then you can't say that a point in the interval is definitionally i naught or i one but if you have a point in the interval where the formula i or i naught holds then that is definitionally well propositionally when you do a case split um i naught or i one so you're actually morally doing a pattern match on the boundary points of the interval and that's specified by a implicit argument which is this var fee um that's uh in the first arguments uh, of h comp after the types yeah right so if this were like pattern matching on the interval then those two clauses together would determine uh a function out of the interval right but they don't it's these are determining sort of partial functions out of the interval yeah. uh, they're only defined on uh some some sub formula of the interval yeah in this case essentially i equals zero or i equals one but in don't the disk, don't look too yeah. hard at partial elements or you're going to break agra. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. Ah, here is the documentation. So if you pull up documentation, like if you don't want, don't want to wait until next week uh, to have me explain it, if, if I'm going to explain it, you can actually see in the documentation, we typed up kind of nicely what this is. So like there's something called a partial element, which is partially defined element of a which is only defined on this phi um, yeah in this case it's something that is defined when i is zero or i is one um, and uh, yeah let's see if i'm scrolling here there's stuff that explains the partial elements and you see the is one predicate and so on but i'm running out of time now so i'm not going to explain it but it is documented at least and i might say more things on monday about it um but yeah but i mean in practice um 
you don't really have to think so much about partial elements. You can kind of think of this as being a weird type of list and uh, that's fine for writing things like, yeah, I think. Okay, any other questions? Well, maybe uh, this is a good moment to uh, say thank you, Anders, for your lecture. We'll <laughs> give people a moment <laughs> to think about their uh, their questions. And uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a debate in the chat about uh, what direction the uh, axes should go. <laughs> since, I have, since I have a voice, since I can speak, I can say that you drew your axes upside down. The, 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 yeah. the J direction points downwards. Right. Yeah, people have very different opinions about this. <laughs> but uh, I was in charge of Emacs here, so I could draw them this, this way. I don't know. I don't know how this happened, but we started like us in Sweden, we kept drawing our axis going up. I don't know if it's a Swedish thing, but the Americans, like Carlin and company, they kept drawing their axis going down. I don't, and I don't know why things ended up that way. I don't know. Do you draw, like, when you write a coordinate system in the US, do you draw it like going down? That is bizarre. Uh, in computer science, but not in math. I mean, right. Ah, that's, yeah, okay. that's kind maybe of the, that's that's the, the reason for maybe. that, yeah. But I, I was in the CS department, but anyway. <laughs> Do you know what the other contentious orientation thing is? When you draw a natural transformation, uh, the commuting diagram for it, for naturality, do you draw the components of that natural transformation horizontally or vertically? They're obviously it, vertical. Yes, exactly. Um, Mike draws them horizontally. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I don't know what I do <laughs> with that case. Anyway, are, are there any questions about the actual content of the lecture and not uh, how we draw <laughs> things in different <laughs> countries? I, um, I, noticed, I, I noticed two things about how you write act. Um, you know that you can put the J inside the pattern matching lambda, right? Ah, here. Yeah. Like this. Uh, no, next to the i equals i one. But don't you have to duplicate it then? Yeah, you do it in every. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a little annoying. But I think it looks better than having. <laughs> um, that wasn't what I was actually going to point out. Um, if you do case split without any variables, then Agda will introduce as many variables on the left hand side as you have pi. So yes. Can, instead of refining a lambda. And like, Raising yeah, I was actually going to point that out too. Um, Wait, what? All right. Uh, well, okay, maybe let's end the recording. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then we can uh, we can <laughs> yes. chat about uh, how to use Agda mode. Um, okay. Uh, thanks. I'll. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, just as a reminder, um, next week uh, Anders will be giving uh, his final lecture on Wednesday. And Egbert will be giving his final two lectures on uh, Monday and Friday. And there is a problem solving session tomorrow. So I'll uh, see you then. <laughs>